talk about statistics. Um, so, uh, sat in a lot of focus groups, knocked on a lot of doors, did a lot of street stalls during the referendum campaign, and people would just constantly say whether they were leaning leave, leaning remain, whatever they were saying, we just want the facts. We just want the facts as if there was going to be some impartial arbiter was going to descend from the sky and just once and for all settle all of those issues, what's better for the economy, how many immigrants are there, what do we get out of the EU. So we thought we should probably try and find this oracle. So we polled it and we focus grouped it and it turned out it was Martin Lewis. Um, so we asked him what he said and he said on balance it was better to remain. So we put that on just about uh, every leaflet we could think of and clearly it didn't work at all. Uh, so here's for, for, for future oracles. I'm open to suggestions if anyone knows any. I suppose it, it, it spoke to something that, that, that Matthew rightly touched on. I think in politics all facts to a degree are contentious because one side will say one thing and during any campaign no side will let, let the other side just say something without letting it slide and there's always a competing statistic that you can offer. I think this was particularly true during the referendum campaign because you were by definition both sides trying to prove an alternative either history or future that never existed. So what if we hadn't joined the EU in the 1970s? How would our economy have done? What would Britain have looked like? We'll never know. Similarly, are anybody making an argument about future projections, which is of course how economists and businesses make a lot of their decisions, were doing so based on a future that didn't yet exist. So we were saying one thing and people would say, well, that's just a projection. How can you possibly know? And same would go for the, for the Leave side. So there was no real provable facts in this debate, to be honest with you. So they were always going to be, they were always going to be con contested. And I'll say this, there were a lot of stats used in the campaign and, you know, both sides received legitimate criticism for their use of statistics. So I'm not going to stand here and spend my entire 10 minutes, much as I would like to, criticising the Leave campaign's use of statistics. My views on the subject are pretty well known. Uh, check out Twitter for further, de further details. Um, what I will say, though, is that uh, on the Remain campaign, we did try and use accurate data and perhaps more importantly, properly sourced data in everything that, that we did. When we put out statistics, we were always at pains to say where we got them from. So this was probably our most notorious leaflet. It's tiny, so I don't expect you to see it, but it's seven facts you need to know before the EU referendum. And we put them out on there, the Treasury, the Treasury, the London School of Economics, the Treasury, the Office of National Statistics, the Office of National Statistics, and HMRC. And they were the seven best we used during the campaign. Now you can contest them, but these weren't figures just dreamt up by the Remain campaign. They were used by independent, we would say, authorities. But as I say, people rejected that. Now, another reason why you should, uh, to understand why we used the particular statistics that we did is that they were considered to be two iron rules of, of politics, and I think the Brexit debate has proven that they are melting in the furnace of it. Um, but they were effectively the economic arguments trumped everything. That at the ballot box, people would always vote on the economy over everything over everything else, and it's why Matthew and, and his campaign put a lot of time into earning what he described as a score draw on the economy because they knew that it was the top of voters' concerns. I think in the Brexit debate, you could argue that immigration and sovereignty were at least part to it, if not trumped it, in the eyes of many, many, many voters. But that was the first. And the second is that people generally, and Matthew touched on this as well, default back to the status quo uh, when they're undecided at the last minute, or oh, they better not risk it. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what they do. So a lot of our statistics that we used were to drive those two vote, to, uh, vote winners. And it led to an inevitable focus on, on the economy. Now, we had three core pillars to our argument. One was the economy, second was our security being enhanced by cooperation in Europe, and third was Britain's place in the world. We have a greater voice at the top table of world politics because we have a stronger voice at the top table of European politics. The second two don't lend themselves as much to statistics as the economy does. So, you know, the vast majority of our campaign was spent talking about economic figures. And the other thing that the focus groups and polling showed us was that people needed to be persuaded of two things. These are people who are wavering, people who already made their mind up, had made their mind up by definition. That firstly, they needed to be convinced that membership of the European Union was good for our economy as a whole, trade, investment, relatively abstract concepts to people, but they still need to be persuaded of it. But secondly, and arguably more importantly, they need to be persuaded that there would be a very real impact on them and their family of leaving, so whether it's their job, whether it's the impact on public services in their area, their, their wages, whatever it might be, it couldn't just be abstract facts about the total value of trade or the one trillion pound in 
investment that's driven into this country because that is frankly too intangible for a lot of people to understand N not on un not unreasonably it needs to be broken down for people into much more real examples and that is where and it was a controversial figure at the time the 4,300 per household figure comes from it's not a particularly innovative way of making a statistical argument you take the total loss to the public finances and you divide it by the average number of households in the in the country it is bog standard now were we saying that every single household will lose 4,300 no it's average it's indicative that's the whole point of an average and not everybody loses the same it's an average but look it was very well rebutted by, by the other side I must say but part of part of it is that people didn't believe that those wider impacts on investment and trade and the wider economy things that were a bit intangible would actually result in the specific loss to them or their family or indeed their their local communities um, so that's the that's that's what drove us to use the economic statistics that we did and then the way that we used them was we were also told and it wasn't just Martin Lewis but the people did want to hear from experts they did want to you know they were tired of politicians not not surprisingly they wanted to hear from business from academics from all of those people who Suzanne pointed out you know polled very polled, polled very well now we built this incredible coalition of people it was businesses large and small trade bodies trade unions charities celebrities environmentalists scientists academics sports figures world leaders you name it they were wheeled out by the remain campaign during the referendum to give give a lift to our fairly dry statistics on integrated pan-european supply chains or how the single market uh, works ac uh, across borders in the automotive I industry you needed experts to frankly get you on the TV um, now M Michael Gove famously said that the public had had, a, had enough of experts I don't agree with him on this as on so much um, but uh, what I would say is uh, I think there was a different different problem for us in that we probably overused our key weapons, which were the economic argument uh, and experts to deploy it before the short campaign, before the last six weeks when a lot of people made their minds up, particularly people who are on the fence one way or the other. And what it meant was that immigration sovereignty, A, came to the fore, very skillfully done by the, by the Leave campaign, but there was also a sense, and this is really amongst the media, that when I was pitching stories, they'd say, well, it's just another global business leader coming out for Remain. And you'd say, oh, hold on a minute, it's the chief executive of Hitachi. He employs 7,500 people in Britain. Well, we've heard it all before, whereas because it was a rare occasion for the leave, they'd say, as I've got a chat from Tate and Lyle on. Well, you know, they should have been given equivalents. But every day we could have rustled up a major business leader, a major world economic organisation. But the media were, frankly, quite sick of our narrative whereas it was a big event when James Dyson or the guy from Tate and Lyle came out because they were so few and far between so where does that leave me what 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 mistakes uh, did we make I think probably if I had my time again we used too many numbers we tried to demonstrate the impact on each different sector on each different part of our economy over time on oh, you know we, we pushed out tens if not hundreds of statistics whereas vote leave really used one the now infamous 350 million figure and I felt and again if I had my time again I'd do things differently clearly in, in so many ways but um, uh, that we were chased off some figures that we thought well were, oh, were highly contested so 350 million figure you can say that study after study independent study after independent study has proven you get a 10 to 1 return on your investment but because that was so aggressively attacked as a statistic not just by the leave campaigns which is of course legitimate uh, campaign tactics but by the media as well we were kind of hounded off it because it you know it's contestable it's based on future but um, past growth but uh, the leave campaign to their credit or otherwise I'll let you be the judge were not hounded off their key statistic which has absolutely no basis in reality whatsoever um, and then um, the Matthew touched on this as well I thought the too often are we concentrate on the source i.e. the messenger rather than the statistic itself and that the leave campaign were very effective in discrediting people uh, who were pushing our message for having ul uh, uh, ulterior motives they were 
uh, in favour of us joining the e Euro. They were on the EU payroll. They were a part of a shadowy cabal of people dreaming of an, a, a European super state. Or, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to participate in the debate. I mean, God forbid that the Bank of England, the governor of the Bank of England, may give you his views on, on the economy, uh, for example. Um, I'd just say one other, one other thing. I think part of it, and I don't blame, I don't blame, blame the media at all for, for this, because it's a, very, it's a very tough job, and we feed it people on both sides of the campaign. But I think there is an ever-growing thirst, particularly in a 24-hour news cycle, for new statistics. You know, you pitch a story, and this is what I do every day, really. You pitch a story and they say, oh, has he got any new figures to go with that? Even if it's someone really interesting, making an interesting argument, oh, where's your fresh, where's your fresh figures? And so we provide them just to give a new news line, to get a new way into an old, an old debate. And I think that has become a bit of a self-perpetuating cycle that unless something has a new number attached to it it's not news when actually you know some of the debates that we that we had in the, in the referendum about the benefits of single market membership probably could have done with a bit more detail on how it works who benefits what sectors what are different trade bodies think well in fact you couldn't get it past the desk uh, for the six o'clock news for example unless it had a unless it had a figure attached to it um so if i if i was to quickly just say that a couple of things that i thought I learn perhaps how we go go forward because I think perhaps firstly is that I do think there needs to be a greater element of a referee in in statistics when it comes to political campaigning there is very effective regulation of how you run yourself and quite rightly so how you spend your money all the rest of it there isn't any recourse really whatsoever if you put a statistic that is not really accurate on a leaflet in a party political broadcast in you get people saying on tv plaster it all over the side of a bus you don't really have anyone to go to to say this is unacceptable to use and i think that needs to be that needs to that needs to change i'm not saying i have a off-the-shelf solution solution to it but i think the idea that now every campaign will look at the incredibly uh, effective tactics of, of vote leave and say well we are in a post-truth politics age politicians have always bent the truth but do we now just drive a bus quite literally through it um and say we don't need to pay any heed anymore and i think it is probably naive to suggest that people in the political campaigns are going to be responsible for a better system of self-regulation than a, an independent third-party arbiter but that's just my bitterness call me a ramona or a, or a brimona um and um and then secondly would be that about the both campaigns and the media becoming less dependent on statistics to to draw their conclusions you know a nice graphic on the telly is brilliant to watch but you know a debate about the single market it does not make